Hello. Hello. Welcome to Tea with the Druid um, 215. It's lovely to see you. And it's lovely to see everybody coming into the forest clearing to listen to this uh, session. And I can see there are people from Greece and Portugal and the Scottish Highlands and St. Lucia and rainy Missouri and Australia. I wonder if you're wet in Australia. Lincolnshire, much cooler London, Stuttgart, Pender Island, Loch Sunat. Too hot Dallas. Yeah, Grenada in the Caribbean. Wow. Joe in Australia, Nascot Wood Hearts, California, New Hampshire. Tbilisi in Georgia. Wow. Hello. Hello there. Uh, Pennsylvania. Great. Lovely. Everybody is really, really welcome. It's lovely to be with you. It's I just I was talking to somebody the other day about about why I do these. And the reason I do this is because it's just a lovely way to come together. You know, in this kind of physical world, it would be really hard of us to all be together. And let's face it, you know, I mean, it would just be really hard and we'd burn up a lot of fossil fuels flying to somewhere and, you know, and it just wouldn't happen. But we can do here. And there's the limitation of the medium, you know, because I've got the mic and you haven't. But with the comments, we can somehow get around this. And today I thought we'd explore something really interesting. <clears throat> I came across uh, an article uh, that I was uh, an article this morning about this guy who's um, been working with rejection therapy. Now this is so interesting. Um, they did some research. You know how how hurtful it is to be rejected. We all know that if somebody says no to you, uh, it's it's often a very painful and hurtful experience. When they were doing some research around it, they they put somebody in a in a um, imaging brain imaging uh, scanner, and they saw that the part of the brain that was activated when people experienced rejection was the same part of the brain that actually registers physical pain. So when we use in our language, when we say that hurt me, I was really hurt by being rejected by the publisher, the potential new friend, who, whoever it was, the teacher, you know, the mother, my father, whatever. It was really hurtful. And so we used that word, hurt. And a chap called Jason Comley came up with the idea of a therapeutic game uh, that he put into practice himself, which um, was based on a psychotherapeutic like, principle that if you can uh, gradually expose yourself to an experience over time, it starts to lose its its charge. And it's used in phobias, for instance, where you know you might be very scared of spiders, but if you can if you can gradually work with the the first of all the idea, just the thought of a spider. And then with looking at pictures in a book and then with playing with rubber spiders. And then finally, may, maybe you'll be OK with the, with the real thing. So so he based it on some sound psychological principles. And his idea is very simple. It's that you deliberately seek rejections and you do it for 30 days. So you go up to a stranger in the street and ask them if you can borrow $100, 100 pounds. And of course, the chances are they'll say no, no, certainly not. And um, the game makes it interesting because the cards make different suggestions. And there are some nice, simple rules to the game that um, that it, it counts if you're out of your com comfort zone. Um, you, not the other person, should be in a position of vulnerability. So you should be sensitive to the feelings of the person who's being asked. Um, and some players develop strategies and coping mechanisms for managing the fear before rejection, because, of course, I mean, it's such a scary idea, isn't it? I'd find it really hard to do this. Um, so people use mindfulness uh, and they are advised to start with small rejections before graduating to more emotionally and socially meaningful rejections. So. Um, so I got to thinking about this, and, um, and, and and I thought, that's interesting. Not only do I fear rejection, as I guess we all do, but I also find it incre incredibly difficult to reject, to say no to people. I have a huge problem in saying uh, no to people. Um, and I thought, 
there was a way in which we can work together as a group uh, whereby you can experience some rejection that's quite safe because we'll set it up nicely. And uh, Nancy says, sounds a bit like exposure therapy. Exactly. So let's let's play this game now. Let's see if it works. Who knows? Maybe it won't work. I don't know. Let's see. So, so you can ask me something, make a request to me uh, by typing it in online, and I will say no. So you'll be helping me because I'll want to say yes to you because I hate saying no but I shall force myself for this game to say no to you. And so you can feel rejected and I can strengthen my naysaying muscle. Um, Matthew is asking, will you please fly me to the UK so I can meet you? No, Matthew, I won't. I'm not going to do that. Sing John Barleycorn now, says Jeff. Certainly not, Jeff. I'm not going to. Draw the world a card. No, Budgie, I'm not going to. Hang on, it's going so fast. I'd like a month off from work, please. Certainly not. Get back to work right away. Um, will you marry me? No, Catherine, I won't. Can I have your house? No, certainly not. Can I come and stay at your house? No, you can't. Sorry. <laughs> please come and host a ritual on my land in Montana. Yes. Oh, no, sorry. No, no, I'm not going to do it. Can I come round for tea? Asks Steve. He gave me a lovely film about about the, we used in Tea for a Drift for ages. So it's so hard for me to say no to you, Dean, but I'm going to say no. Can we meet at Stonehenge? No. Will you come and visit us soon in Aotearoa, please? No, I'm not going to New Zealand. Oh, this is fun, as Kylina says. Um, <laughs> please arrange a free trip to the UK. No, certainly not. Will you be a prime minister, please? No. God, I... Well, let's not go there. Um, can you come to my lunar seven? <laughs> please cut your hair. No, certainly not. Will you sing some opera? What? No, no, I'm not going to do that. Will you make me a character in your next tarot deck, says Andrew? No, no. Can I do the body course for free, please? No. Um, this is not fun at all, says Cindy. Um, please, may I have your cactus? No, certainly not. I'm keeping it here. It's going nowhere. Um, can you kiss me, says Sherry? No, certainly not. Please, please read a poem. OK, I'm going to break the rule and I'm going to read you a poem. Hey, how about that? I'm going to read you a poem because I thought... If I play this game with you, thank you, by the way. Thank you very <laughs> Can I have the brain on the shelf? No, I need it. If I ever lose mine, I know I've got a rubber one. Over... How, does, how does this work? Over there. I've got a rubber one over there that I can use. Um, yeah, gosh, that was fun. Um, <laughs> will you please say no? Somebody's trying to catch me out there. Um, okay, so... Um, so I, I came up with this. I was sitting in bed with a cup of coffee, reading this article and thinking, thinking up this game and saying, hey, that would be fun to do with everybody this evening. And then I thought, well, how are you going to transition to doing anything, talking about anything else, doing something serious? And I found the answer. And the, oft, the answer often is in poetry, isn't it? So I found the answer. I just reached for a book that I like very much, The Temple of Warm Harmony by Frank Owen. And I opened it and there was just the right poem to read. So I'll get to that in a minute, but let's just linger with this question of rejection because, you know, we had fun with that, but of course it's huge. And on I'll give some links in my blog post on this, but, you know, it's really interesting if you look at the rejection therapy side. Um, there's in the blogs, the sort of guest posts, there's a social worker in Norway who tried this. She she got on a bus in Norway and everybody's very private in Norway. Nobody's sitting on the bus except one guy, kind of athletic looking guy. And she has a prejudice about athletic guys because she's got a problematic leg or something. So you know, she has an issue around them and kind of has made an assumption about the sort of person and they are people they are. So she forces herself to go and sit next to him, which is a, a big deal. As you know, you know, it's like you've got the whole bus and you're sitting next to me. Why? You know. And then she asks him a question. Some, well, first of all, she says, Can I sit next to you? Expecting him to say, Well, no, why don't you sit over there? But he says yes, and he moves his bags. So then she pushes it a bit and she says, How are you? And he takes his glasses off and he looks at her. And he said, Do you know nobody? has ever in public 
asked me that question. No stranger has ever come up and asked me that question. And they proceeded to engage in a conversation. And it's so touching. He says in the end, let me quote for you. I started to ask him about his life. His response was to remove his earplugs, shift his relaxed position and give me a real answer. Finally, I told him about my new project and he said, and get this, that no stranger ever asked him about his day in public before. This needs to keep happening, he said. I think you're onto something. Isn't it kind of funny how we put on a show in public pretending not to care about each other because we actually care way too much about what the other person really thinks about us. Fantastic. And then she goes deeper with this. She said, this helped me realize that part of my kit fear came from my own prejudice against this guy. So the, the, so this chap, Jason Cumley, started this card game, and I'll give you links and all the rest of it. And there's there's a lovely TED talk by a guy called Jia Jiang in, in China who told, tells the story about a, 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 a an idea his teacher had when he was in primary school. He was only six years old, and his teacher thought of a game where each child would stand up and the other members of the class would compliment the child standing up. And it worked fine right the way through 15 children, 16 children, 17 children. And then for the last three children, they the kids kind of ran out of steam and they wouldn't give compliments to them. And he said, I could feel even at the age of six, I could feel my teacher freaking out because it's like this, this has gone horribly wrong. So she said, well, you know, maybe in the next class we'll do this again and you know, all the rest of it. But of course, he never forgot it. He was wounded by that little six-year-old kid. None of his fellow pupils would compliment him. And he carried that wound uh, for years until he came to this game and this site that Jason Comley had started. And he applied the 30-day challenge and he found it really worked. And he also found something else, which is that the majority of people are actually really rather nice. And, you know, it's the rare person who's the bad apple and who is unpleasant. And he and there's a video on, on YouTube you can see that's been watched two million times of where he one of on one of the challenges, he goes into a Krispy Kreme donut shop and he asks them to make uh, donuts in the shape of the Olympic rings, expecting, of course, the person behind the counter to say, well, no, we're not going to do that. But he actually films what happens. And the girl behind the counter says, it's been ages since I watched the Olympics. That's an interesting idea. And basically, she makes him the <laughs> donuts. He says this is the most embarrassing time of his life because he was totally expecting to be rejected. And instead, they end up hugging each other. And he walks out with a box of donuts uh, arranged like uh, Olympic rings. And um, so there's a kind of added payoff uh, in this story as well. So um, there you go. Uh, something to mull over and consider and i was thinking about um our daughter sophie is in the uh uh she she trained as an actor and then as a film director and now she's a casting agent and so she's totally in that world and of course you know uh you know she's been in films and television and stuff like that so and with lots of her friends too so we really know that world of rejection that occurs uh, in that world. And I thought this would be a great piece of work to do in drama schools, training, toughening the, that muscle up that can take rejection because it can be so hurtful and can, <laughs> Dixie says, can Sophie cast me? No, she can't. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I think there's a lot of mileage in this and I am now going to switch focus because what do you do? Okay, let's see if I can get a segue from this. So here we are. This is a this is a uh, a session that we do to find calm and peace. Tea with the Druid, a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of exploration of that meeting place between psychology and spirituality. You know, one of the ways to deal with rejection is to reinforce the muscle and just make us a little bit more thick-skinned and and open to you know, the uncertainty that comes with life. Uh, 
but there's another another thing that another way to work as well which is what spirituality can offer i would like to suggest which is the whole purpose of following a spiritual way is to teach us well one of the purposes let's say is to teach us not to fully identify with the ego with the personality that we work through in this particular incarnation this life uh, the spiritual way shows us that there's a deep self a higher self a soul an inner center that is immune from the slings and arrows of this world and if we ever needed that kind of teaching or experience or understanding it's today when the world is in such a mess and is there is such pain and conflict and difficulty and uh so 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 this tea has ended up being i suppose about two ways to work with feelings of being heard and feelings of rejection and this way that we're going to look at now and do a meditation with let me open it by reading mountain wise storehouse by frank owen ceaseless reminders worldly imperfection people whole worlds out of harmony with the way centuries of misalignment leave spine jolting ruts in the road people whole worlds out of harmony with the way centuries of misalignment leave spine jolting ruts in the road this is why we go to the mountains to remember the great realignment always available to the supple hearted to remember the great realignment always available to the supple hearted so let's engage in that act of remembrance now by becoming aware of being seated in the forest clearing beloved of druids the sacred grove and while we're perfectly aware of being seated in our homes looking at our tablets or phones or screens we can allow that sense to gently gently fade a little from our awareness as we allow the world of the imagination and, the, and of the spirit to become stronger to sense ourselves coming through the woods and finding ourselves in a forest clearing and being seated on the ground and in being seated on the ground you enjoy the feeling of being close to the earth and you allow all your troubles and anxieties to drop away and you take in a slow deep breath and you breathe out fully and deeply <clears throat> And as you breathe in again, you smell the smell of the earth. You sense all the life and the vitality in the earth, the moisture, the stones, the sand, the rock, the clay, the minerals, and crystals, all the millions of creatures, all the life that is in the soil, and the energy of the soil, the subtle energy of the soil and of the earth flows up into your being filling you with a sense of stability and of healing. And you look around you in the circle and you see the trees around you and you sense their presence and their power. And you breathe in the scent of the trees and you sense the trees as brothers and sisters, fellow beings gathered around you, offering you their protection, their shade, their oxygen and you become aware of the sky above you and you breathe in deeply and as you breathe in deeply the energy of the sky flows into your being meeting the energy of the earth within the center of yourself and feeling centered and calm 
you might decide that you want to take a journey. If you want to stay in the grove, that's fine. Or you might find that you want to follow a little path that leads out through the woods and up into the hills. And if you do this, you find yourself following the path, hearing the sounds of birds in the trees, sensing the little creatures scuttling in the forest as you move eff effortlessly towards the edge of the woods, coming out from the tree line now and starting to walk up this hill. It's starting to look rather like a mountain, actually. But there's a clear path and it's safe. And you find yourself gradually coming to a place on this mountainside that is flat and comfortable and maybe there's a beautiful smooth stone there that you can sit on really comfortably and you find yourself sitting down now <clears throat> and looking out across the panorama the forest and the sea below you meadows and fields in the distance that great sense of the land stretching out below you maybe your seat is contained within a kind of shallow cave that provides you protection from the wind and helps you to feel really within the embrace of the mountain. And you close your inner eyes now and you just open to the strength of the mountain and to the spirit of the mountain. And let's sit in silence now as we just open to the peace and the inspiration that sitting with the mountain can bring. And knowing that I can retreat to the mountaintop, that I can gaze out on the beauty of the world, that I can send my love and my blessings to all living beings from this place, whenever I wish, I ask that I might be open-hearted, supple-hearted, free from concerns about my ego, free from concerns about whether or not I'm accepted or rejected, free from concerns about what other people think about me, because I feel at one with all of life. I feel blessed by the spirit of this mountain and blessed by this day. And then knowing that I can return at any time to this mountain top, I found myself I find myself taking the path down the mountain path, coming to the tree line, walking through the path in the woods to arrive in the sacred grove. And as I sit in the sacred grove, it's possible that I see other members of this grove seated around me. And I open to the sense of community and support and connection that I feel with all, with all those of us here. And then gently I allow this sense of being seated in the sacred grove to fade as I become more and more aware of being seated here, fully present here and now in front of my screen. And when I feel ready, I open my eyes.
So thank you all for for being here. Thank you all for being you. Um, and I'll put up links to those various uh, rejection therapy sites, resilience, emotional resilience courses that Sandy mentions. Um, and, um, and I'll also mention this book by Frank, Frank Owen, The Temple of Warm Harmony. Um, so, um, good to be with you. I always want to, to, to stay for ages with you, but, but we're coming up to the half an hour mark. So let's, let's finish now. And, um, I won't be with you. I'm going to be in the Netherlands for the next two weeks. So we will have guest presenters. And those of you who saw the invitation to the tea this evening, that was my grandson who happened to be here and I said to him hey do you fancy making the announcement uh, so James very kindly jumped in and uh, invited everybody to the tea tonight okay so I'm gonna read all your comments now thank you much love many blessings and see you in three weeks time okay bye <laughs>